Akari. Akari has been my mentor throughout this program. And uh, he's just been wonderful to be with. Um, his relationship with me actually uh, it is, it has gone beyond just mentoring me in this program. But the relationship has spilled into other areas of my professional life. And, uh, I made a decision way back that uh, my relationship with him was going to be for keeps. So I want to thank him very much. And um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank um, the African Studies Center for making it possible uh, for me to be here to, to learn and to see how we can uh, better our situation back home at King University. Uh, today, <coughs> I have um, what I want to talk on has to do with the um, King USD's instructional design framework and making the case for the adoption of the AD model and Maya's principles of multimedia instructional design. <coughs> the place of the study uh, is in Ghana. Uh, as you may know, Ghana is just about 289 square kilometers. And, uh, Water Lake, Oti, White Bottle, and other rivers constitute of 3.5% of the, the area. And uh, the just released estimate for 2010 population census, population and housing census, is just about uh, 24 million. Uh, if you look at the population density, it looks like uh, <laughs> We need more men in Ghana. <laughs> 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 and, uh, in the Ashanti region, where the university is located, specifically at, uh, in the town of Kumasi, the population is about 1.5 million, and the elevation above sea level is around 250 uh, meters above sea level. Um, this, this particular image talks so much about KUS's drive to make sure that technology transforms the lives of the people in Ghana as well as the whole of Africa. Um, the OER, or the Open Educational Resources, is being uh, spearheaded by the College of Health Sciences, which has uh, four faculties, 24 departments, and one research center and all these other uh, departments, and also by the Department of Communication Design, we call the code. And incidentally, that building over there is, has a space in there where we've earmarked for OER, what's the media studio, and to help with the technical production of the lesson modules. Um, <coughs> OER, let me explain this and then we can get into it. OER has to simply <coughs> open educational uh, resources. We are resources which are openly licensed for uh, repurposing by anybody. In other words, once you produce a work and tag it with the Creative Commons license attribution, um, it becomes an open resource. You can pick it and tag it, change it to fit your situation. So people have the, uh, the right, once it's tagged as an open resource, to repurpose it for their own use. It's basically um, works together with that Creative Commons uh, property license because the usual copyright license is a bit inhibiting. And so this license provides a way of life for Educational materials to be put out there. OER was begun some years back at the University of uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and also did a lot in making uh, a lot of noise about it and caught the attention of many people and donor institutions. And so, all over the world, in uh, Africa and Europe, in the Americas and uh, in Asia, you find out that there's a lot of investment in producing these lesson modules to make sure that educational uh, <coughs> uh, 
uh, openings for people uh, become wider and wider. At Kenya University, um, we started late in uh, 2008 and with the Ministry of um, Health, University of Ghana, and then the Bill and the Melinda Gates Foundation and then the other funding institution. Um, Kenya University has about 23,000 students and that makes it the second largest institution in Ghana. Uh, it is second to the University of Ghana and it's the College of Health Sciences which is responsible for training healthcare workers. Uh, unfortunately, Ghana struggles with low doctor to patient ratios. Uh, we have 0 0.15 doctors and 0 0.92 nurses per 1,000 Ghanaians, as if uh, you have nurses and doctors <laughs> designated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the, the OER comes in to help drive up the education in, in, in health science. Um, one thing which has been realized is that uh, in most institutions, um, with the start of the OER programs, um, they just don't go far. Because often we find out that there are no institutional policies which binds everybody. So when they started with all the enthusiasm and the zeal, um, it just it fills us out. It doesn't go anywhere because some authorities frown up on that. Uh, so um, learning from that experience, um, in late 2009, um, a group of people were put together to develop an OER policy. And apart from other policies in that policy, <coughs> there are three or four major areas which uh, gives it the necessary legs to be able to allow us to you know, do the work of OER development. So we what the policy intends to do is to, or what, yeah, the support is to the identification of human resources, uh, to support faculty in training, teaching, and learning materials into OER. And then also to clarify publication rights and policies regarding the use of a required infrastructure and other support services. For those of you who are familiar with uh, copyright situation in Ghana, uh, you would understand that uh, this is very important because we've had a stormy situation in Ghana where the copyright uh, legislation um, has been kept in the office of the president for some time because the different groupings were lobbying for certain clauses to be uh, captured uh, in the bill. So it's a situation which is still ongoing and we just hope that in the near future, everything will be dealt with. And then the policy also defines the collaborations within the universities, the colleges, and then research institutions, and the relationship between KUST and other affiliated institutions who are in the OER program. And then the last point is also to develop and review OER materials for us to share them on a worldwide scale. This is particularly important because um, the kind of materials you send out there invariably has a way of casting a certain image about your institution. There has to be quality and uh, there also has to be a sense of proper structuring or the lesson modules or materials which are put out there. At a recent workshop, or uh, yeah, a review workshop, at the College of Health Sciences, from uh, our pharmacology department, we realized that there were problems with the, or challenges with the lesson modules which had been produced so far. Ken as of 2010, December 2010, had produced 14 lesson modules. And we realized that in all of the, or in most of the materials, which had been produced, uh, there was no sign of instructional design structuring. And um, we also realized that there was too much extraneous materials included in the lesson modules which are produced. The students in the Department of Communication Design, uh, well, they, are, they have the competence, they have the skills. 
but creating lesson modules um, also requires some additional information which they lack. So we realized that more often than not, the lesson modules they produced didn't end up getting for us the intended learning outcomes. So what I decided to do was to make a case for us to adopt an instructional uh, system design model, which is the AD model. It's an acronym for analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. I believe <laughs> that the AD model creates a fluid system for us to be able to develop the lesson modules. And uh, this system also will take into consideration the peculiar characteristics of the KMST's learning environment. Uh, secondly, I also uh, made the case for the adoption of the cognitive theory of learning, which has been espoused so much by Richard Meyer. And this theory has crystallized for us 12 principles, which I believe that <coughs> media specialists could combine seamlessly with the principles of visual design in order for us to get uh, very good lesson modules which can help out the students or whoever assesses them to be able to learn and develop. Now, instructional system designs are models which are, there are lots of models out there um, Invariably, what they aim at is to provide if effective and efficient way of producing uh, uh, learning modules or learning aids or whatever. And uh, there are different different types of them which are suited for different uh, situations. They are usually informed by pedagogy and andragogy. Andragogy because uh, they are based on adult learning and tested theories and the results have been put out there for people to know that they are workable. There are many instructional design models. We have the Allen's survey. This is a very interesting model which uh, I initially thought could fix very much the situation of Kane University. But uh, along the line, I realized that um, it, would, it just wasn't the right one. And then uh, we also have uh, Dick and Carry Systems Approach. We have um, the Morrison Roskam model, OER model, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I have a few samples. This is uh, an example of the Morrison Roskam system design model. And you would notice, interestingly, that you find analyze, you find develop, you find design, you find implement, you find evaluate. These are critical points which you uh, you will see as we go along. Then we also have Dick Carey systems approach. And when you look at this one, you will also realize that he also talks about uh, development, he talks about uh, formative evaluation and summative evaluation, and so on. This is the survey process I was talking about. The survey process is very interesting because it allows you to initially gather your information, and then you start something. You, you have your background, you design, you do a prototype, you review it. Uh, if it doesn't work, you go back to the redesign. You know, you juggle around the more, um, the lesson model until you think you are good to go. So then you take it to the next stage of proofing the design. And so that would involve additional people coming in, uh, SMEs and so on, to make their input. And so then you have the alpha, beta, and then full steam ahead when you have the good version. But then we realized that um, the one I was 
making a case for the RG model has the analysis, the design, development, implementation, and evaluation stages. You would realize that all those examples we give are built on this one. This is a classic model which fits into many situations, although it's been criticized so much. Um, in the analysis phase, well, let me just backtrack a moment. Uh, you would realize that analysis, right from analysis, you move down to design. Then you go down and so on after evaluation. However, uh, there is a relationship between evaluation, implementation, backwards. And so it is a fluid system. You can always go back and make changes which do not help your situation. So in the analysis phase, we have, you, it's important to recognize who the learners are and their characteristics, and then what you seek to be the outcome. Uh, because we believe that when there's good, uh, there are good learning outcomes, it will result in behavioral change of students. And then you also need to, at this place, we'll recognize the constraints that the learner has. Then when you come to um, the design phase, this is where, um, after the analysis, you have to deal with issues like the learning objectives and the way you assess the lesson modules you produce and the kind of exercises you will give. Um, the popular one is the multiple choice uh, questions. And I remember <laughs> having a discussion with Kyle some time ago when he talked about um, possible answer <laughs> uh, questions, you know, yeah. And uh, maybe some other time <laughs> he might be able to talk about that. Um, and then uh, at this stage, you also look at content uh, and then the subject matter, how you plan the lesson, and then the kind of media you select. You need to be conscious of the fact that at this stage, if there are different colors which affect people in different ways. So as a visual uh, designer, you, in as much as you take note of the principles of uh, visual design, um, you have to blend it in a very nice way with Maya's instructional design principles to be able to get the kind of lesson outcomes that you want, or properly structured uh, lesson models which gives us the best learning outcomes. I'm saying this because um, if in the principles of design, we talk about proportion, we talk about negative, positive areas, we talk about color psychology, and so on and so forth. And to a large extent, somebody might look at the work of a visual designer and say that it is subjective. But if, we, if the media specialists combine Maya's instructional design principles, um, we would have a situation where most people will agree with the object of the uh, lesson module. And so at this stage, you, you can then go on and then have your uh, prototypes and see how um, it works. But usually, it's advisable that the prototypes are uh, evaluated with the help of the subject matter expert and then any other review board which is in place. At this stage, um, it's important also to note how um, assessments could also be done. Um, or could be incorporated in the design of the lesson module. From there, we move on to the development phase where we put all these things together based on the blueprint we got in the design phase. So then we develop the sessions, the guides, and so on and so forth. This is very important because um, here we look at uh, developing participant assessment project and evaluation instruments. And this is where you are able to get feedback on the kind of lesson model you produce. If people are not able to give evaluations on the lesson models they get, you don't get feedback to be able to help you to make better the material you put out there. And then we have the implementation stage where uh, you can demonstrate at the whole stage level what um, you have done. So at this stage, you, you can then 
finalize everything. You can conduct demo sessions and then uh, finalize everything and put it out there uh, online. The evaluation phase also consists of two parts, formative and uh, summative. Formative uh, evaluation is present at every stage. Those were the fluid lines I showed earlier on in the EV model. And then we have the summative evaluation, which covers the whole model. These things are usually enough for feedback from users. Uh, we could decide to use peer review, star user ratings, or feedback form. And I remember this at a point became almost a contentious issue during the review workshop because some instructors felt that um, I mean, I mean, how could they have students evaluating that? I mean, if a student evaluates you, I mean, yeah. what is he telling you? Is he telling you that you know your stuff or you don't know what you put out there? But I support the, uh, the argument that we must have um, some kind of feedback or evaluation because this is what will help us to make the adjustments we need to make our session better. So then when lesson uh, models are put out there online, then anybody either in China or in London or Brazil or the US who looks at it, the student will know that this has been properly done. Yeah, as I said earlier, the aging model has been criticized so much. I mean, it's so much so that <laughs> initially, I felt discouraged uh, because some people were saying it was too slow, clumsy, that it wasn't appropriate for today's digital world, that it was too time consuming. But this one was what really hit me hard because I was wondering how it was too time consuming because if you don't take time to produce a good lesson model, then what, what else do they do? Okay, so, and interestingly, if you look at all of them, all of the different models, you realize that Although they criticize the edit model, it is still the edit model which forms as the basis for all the other ones which are designed. So what I did for our situation and Ken USD was to make an, a little adjustment to the edit model. You have this, we have the ADGIE. And you realize that all these things support pedagogy. Pedagogy is simply the procedure or the processes involved in teaching. So if we have all these things in place and have research over here, it will take this particular model will take into consideration King uh, uh, learning environment. Because there's a this health OER uh, production involves two department, the College of Health Sciences and the Department of Communication Design. And the media specialists would have to go through a whole lot of stages before they come even to the analysis <coughs> stage. So <coughs> I thought, if we have this model diagram hanging there in the studio, the media, it would be a very good um, aid for the media specialists to follow. We we'll realize that the research moves down to analysis all the way to evaluation. And evaluation also goes to research, analysis, and so on and so forth. So all of them are connected <coughs> in one way or the other. So instead of ADI, we have the modified ADI, which is the RADI for Kenyan USD. <laughs> um, the reason is that Media specialists usually have to contact College of Health Science um, faculty with uh, proposed OER projects. And then they have to also determine the needed resources and logistical support. <coughs> the main KNUST campus is um, about 20 to 30 minutes drive from the teaching hospital where a lot of video shots um, photographing of procedures and so on are done. So I, I believe that it's important for um, the content provider to sit down with the media specialist, go through all this research process, make sure everything is done, and draw up a basic project uh, outline 
involving the objective scope timelines and resource uh, requirements before they step out of the studio. But sometimes it might involve the use of um, equipment over uh, certain distances to uh, certain places. Sometimes uh, you, you find a media specialist going to um, uh, district hospitals and capturing cases uh, to produce lesson modules. I remember the particular situation of, of uh, uh, some students who had to help this media specialist go to a village to capture cases of bully also. You know, and if it hadn't been for uh, inventiveness on, on the side of the media specialist, it would have really taken a very long time to get the materials necessary to produce the lesson modules. So once an uh, agreement is made on the scope of the project and then the constraints around the uh, lesson model are dealt with, and then we also make sure that at least the data acquisition, whether it's text, audio, video, photography, <coughs> or, or photograph, or whatever, everything is settled with, then we are good to go to the analysis stage. The critical point in the research area has to do with consent from patients, uh, et cetera, being filmed, photographed, or interviewed. Um, we realized that in some of the lesson models which were produced, um, in fact, uh, there was a need to have asked the permission of patients. And some of the lesson models which came to show have had the faces of some of the patients in the lesson models covered in order not to you know, identify them in some of the lesson models which were produced. And then we also have to, and thank God that now we have, we have uh, OP Michigan and uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, has helped so much in getting us uh, logistics for the work we do in the studio. So once we sit down and discuss whatever <coughs> we have to do, then we know the, the kind of uh, equipment we need to take along. And then um, also we make sure at this stage that those who are conducting experiments in the laboratories or having certain procedures going on, uh, whatever, should make sure that they put on the right uh, attire. Uh, in some of the lesson models produced, um, we saw that somebody was using his bare hands to mess chemicals, and that is not, I believe, a standard procedure. Yeah. So, um, the research should take care of all these things. The second point um, uh, case I'm making has to do with me adopting the 12 principles uh, which are embedded in the cognitive theory of multimedia learning by Maya. It's premised on the fact that the human being in the learning <coughs> process selects words and images, organizes the words and the images, and it integrates them with existing knowledge to bring understanding. So if we, <laughs> if, if we look at this, in a way it tells us that then we have to pay particular attention to the way the human being learns in order for us not to overload <laughs> the capacity <laughs> of the human being. <laughs> this one is more than an overload. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you have. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This is uh, <laughs> yeah. So for and then also for meaningful learning to occur, the the theory um, has put out that people have broad channels <coughs> for processing uh, visual and pictorial material, and also auditory and verbal material, and that. <coughs> people have limited capacity for acquiring, uh, uh, what do you call it, <coughs> or for learning. And so there's a need to pay attention to that. And um, it also, the other point is active processing where um, it, it, we understand that learning occurs when people engage in appropriate cognitive processing. Uh, relevant materials, organizing the materials into a coherent structure, integrating what they already know, and then also the transfer of um, 
learn our knowledge. So this is the diagram uh, showing the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. You see how they are taken by the senses, the way they are selected, and uh, what images. There's also a correlation between sounds and images. And uh, the other way is words through the ears, you know, picking up the sounds, verbal. So these two are then integrated together with prior knowledge for knowledge acquisition or for communication to the public. And out of this uh, theory, we have 12 principles. <coughs> Excuse me. We have the coherence principle, which uh, states that people learn better when the strenuous uh, materials, pictures and words are excluded rather than included. Our students, because they are skilled, they have advanced skills, tend to produce lesson modules which has strenuous materials. You find music being played in the background while somebody is talking, or sometimes you find all kinds of uh, what we call uh, Las Vegas effects. <laughs> yeah. <Crazy>. Yeah. <laughs> And then we have the signaling uh, principle where we highlight uh, the core materials that we want to transfer. Redundancy principles that um, you, you, you limit the materials you put out there, that people learn better from graphics and narration than from graphics, narration, and on screen text. We have the spatial continuity principle that, uh, which also states that corresponding words and uh, pictures are presented near, which are presented near are better for people than when they are separated on the page or screen. And um, the fifth one, that the temporal principle, continuity principle, that people learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented simultaneously rather than successively. So the, the principles one to five help minimize extraneous cognitive processing. It, helps, it will help the media specialist not to overload the lesson modules they produce. And then we have the pre-training principle, uh, which says that uh, people learn better from a multimedia lesson when they know the names and characteristics of the main concepts. And so that is why uh, in, uh, it will be helpful to have um, the keywords explained before uh, the student is allowed to go into the meat of the lesson. Then we have the modality principle that people learn from better from graphics and narration than from uh, animation and on screen text. Animation is a whole big one on its own. So uh, principle six to eight also help us to manage essential uh, processing in terms of the cognitive strength. Now this is a. Uh, um, a video which uh, the removal of guinea worm is done the same way today as it was done for the last uh, like millennia. Basically, the problem is that the worm cannot be pulled out all at once uh, because of the danger it, of breaking. You would realize that as a, uh, a the lesson goes on, reaction. highlights the, as in you're text. seeing in this video, the uh, nurse. Pulls uh, it out there. one or two centimeters. And so day, the student is and then able to the end of the worm into concentrate a, uh, bandage on that has been what is being done. Has been soaked in antiseptic. The worm mm -hmm. is then rolled up onto this bandage and into a coil and placed against the open wound. Uh, and then a, a full uh, bandage. I is understand placed with my foot talk with to uh, uh, from Mr. Uh, Pat uh, Patrick Fergo. I understand that this process has been improved upon. Well, this was done to demonstrate, demonstrate. a bad, a bad yeah, way of doing this. A bad, a bad case. Yeah. So um, we understand that how the worms, uh, the way the, the worming process, uh, understand um, has uh, been improved. Then this is the this, uh, this solution or something else is then is put in, in there to make sure that the worm is rejected. Yeah. But. Uh, Media specialists put this particular one in a, in a very bad way. So this was a way by my mentor to make sure that the right thing was done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have the multimedia principles. Uh, this one also says that people learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. This is the basic premise of the theory. And then the personalization principles. We also learn that people learn better 
when the lesson is going on in the conversational style rather than the formal style. So when the media specialists are designing the whole lesson module um, and creating uh, voiceovers and so on, uh, it's important to make sure that you don't get somebody who has a, a rough, abrasive style who is very formal. You get a, a uh, somebody who is conversational and who is friendly uh, in his voice. And then the voice principle uh, uh, also states that people learn better when <coughs> narration in, mod in the multimedia lesson is spoken. Uh, is done in a friendly human voice rather than the use of a machine voice. And then uh, the image principle. There are people who do not necessarily learn better from a multimedia lesson when the speaker's image is added to the screen. And so um, it's n the key word is necessarily. Sometimes it helps for students to learn better. Sometimes it's, an, it's a distraction. And so it is incumbent upon the media specialist to determine um, which is which. So this uh, principles 9 to 12 help also foster innovative uh, cognitive processing. Uh, this picture shows um, the way to treat stills and for you to also be able to control the lesson experience. You realize that over here we have the play key, the stop, uh, reverse, and then the forward keys. If students have a lesson module, a video, then um, they have these features over here, they will be able to control the learning experience. <coughs> Other than fixing one who is two hours or four hours where the student cannot control, the student is forced to listen to all that. Um, it becomes a, a disincentive to the learning process. And it's, al it's also helpful also to have um, cues like this for the student to be able to identify um, <coughs> the key components of whatever is being transmitted. So, um, <laughs> my conclusion is that this ready process takes into consideration the chemistry's <coughs> learning environment. It takes a look at the, uh, the learners are they both on campus and online, uh, content providers who are on campus, and, yeah, and then also the kind of instructional materials uh, we have. Now, it it makes sure that uh, there's a good mix of all these things for us to really have an effective framework uh, to arrange our resources and procedures to get very good learning uh, modules out there. If we are able, as media specialists, uh, to combine these principles of multimedia learning and the principles of visual design, then I think that we will be able to uh, meet the aspirations of pedagogy and then ensure quality assurance and then the needs and expectations of our students and then the faculty and other stakeholders, especially those who fund the program we have in the KUST uh, campus. And uh, uh, I'm recommending that, uh, in actual fact, I'm working on the, although I recommend it, but I'm actually working on this one, the needs assessment of KUST help for your lesson modules. Um, this is important because I think that we will need to go back and then rework the lesson models we have out there and replace the old ones with the new ones. And then I, I think uh, something I've noticed here, in which we haven't done so much at Kenya University, uh, is to, to look at the role of students and advocacy in contributing to the growth of health science we are in Ghana. Here I realize that uh, in Michigan involves lots of students. Yeah, and the design jams, the uh, college views, and so on from students, and are able to do a better job of it here. And I, I think that we would also have to look at something like that, and then see how we can tailor it to a particular circumstances, and uh, also be on the same page with the University of Michigan. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, I, don't, I don't know a lot about instructional design principles or the models, but yeah. um, there's a lot more collaborative learning and group learning going on. Yeah. Are there any particular models that focus on the gains that people get um, in the learning process through the collaboration? 
and they have with, I mean, interactions with other students. Um, usually, what people do is to um, look at their uh, peculiar circumstances and pick the one who best speaks to the situation. And then at the end of the day, what they do is to uh, have a way of assessing how the collaboration has been. I don't know if um, I'm saying your so question. There's no model I've seen which um, quantifies, let's say, the learning process. We can design, uh, we can design learning. Uh, we can design, we can design learning outcomes where we can design the learning process. And so a lot of it depends upon uh, those who make, who study, or students who study, uh, because people have different characteristics and so on, different learning rates. Right, yeah, so it seems like a lot of the models were very linear um, in their application. <laughs> and, and I know, you know, one of the, yeah, the criticisms of the yeah, adding model is that it was linear and, and digital technologies mm -hmm. allow us, well, I mean, the argument is that it allows us to do non-linear learning. Um, but the same argument can be made for group learning, where, you know, not every individual has to be at the exact same step in time or in the learning process at the same moment in time. And so we can be at different levels, but still be learning mm -hmm. um, and, and actually maybe augment learning by being at different levels. Mm -hmm. But I don't know of any particular model that mm -hmm. discusses that. Yeah, it's interesting to know that all these 12 principles have uh, two boundaries within which they work very well. Um, one is that it recognizes the fact that there are experts in learners people who are advanced in learners. And so for those people, you might not want to go through all these stages. Expert learners are such that if you put maybe a few information out there and you put a couple of pointers, they will be able to construct the images and what is necessary you know, to aid their learning. But with uh, the beginners or people who are in the median range, you will need to go through this process in order for them to also have the learning process if I can add to that I mean so M M MIT in physics I don't know if you've seen their study how they they redesigned their physics courses from being a lecture to being small groups and they pre-tested the students and they put the expert learners the middle oh. and the lower in a, in a mixed groups and what they found was actually the expert learners actually learned more mm -hmm. by being part of the other with the others because you know they became more of the leader and the, and the, and the teacher and the, the students who were low, you know, sort of lesser accomplished at the beginning get, had bigger gains because they were part of that collaboration. And so, yeah, I'm sort of following up Peter's question. It'd be interesting to see how you designed, for, you know, how they designed for that. Did they actually designed for it, or did they, you know, luck into that? Yeah. And now, retrospectively, can you develop a model from that experience? Okay. Uh, it would be a good way, be good to look at that and do something about it. Um, but for now, um, in the application of the writing model, um, what the media specialists have to do is to make sure that they satisfy majority of uh, the learners we have by detailing the lesson objectives, uh, explaining keywords, and phrases, and so on before uh, detailing <coughs> the body of the, the lesson uh, together with appropriate media, graphics, images, and so on, to make sure that the learning is Okay. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. I've got two questions. Um, one is to, uh, about the, the radio. The radio, okay. Yeah, I think you can just go back to that, um, uh, to, to the model itself. I think it's uh, the, the danger of using others um, because it, it, it kind of um, makes it to be, like you were saying, uh, one directional. Um, where if you don't use those maybe double arrows or something, and then also the issue of uh, enclosing those letters that into uh, a circle that like uh, there's no movement between between all those uh, letters, it makes it dangerous, and then it directs it to what's what. So if I say um, I just want evaluation only, but you mm -hmm. put me in a way that to get to that point I have to start an R. Yeah. 
and go all the way to to us. Oh. That, that, that to me, uh, that's that, that's what I'm, I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, so okay. It, it kind of actually works in the same way as the AD movement because it's also kind of direct plan. And then it, 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 it tells you you have to start here. You can't start anywhere. And then you have to follow this direction. You can't just do it any other way. So there's just one way of learning. The way the way you have to learn. Okay. Yeah. So um, basically, uh, yeah, if you look at this like um, Peter was saying, it looks as if all of them come with uh, a sense of linearity. Yeah. All the lesson modules. And uh, this is no exception. But however, the interesting thing is that um, yeah, it's an iterative process. You can go backwards, or you can go forward and backwards. Maybe, just like you're saying, I may have to make it a double uh, prompt arrow uh, in order to bring out the picture more. Okay. Uh, so that, um, but as to starting from here, starting from I, uh, Maybe this would be a good guide. Uh, because I'm looking at a situation where somebody could also look at this one. Then it becomes uh, something else. Where we begin from A and end up having R over here, idea. So um, once we have the ready here, uh, uh, it <laughs> we believe that it could help the person or the multimedia specialist to start from this point and then go through the whole thing. But we'll make it double prompt to just to amplify the situation that is a And um, my last question, um, your, 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 your last slide, um, where you showed how, 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 how to design, where the two gears go forward and, and uh, I saw also something that you're saying, um, the, the, the visual should, should be correct in, in a way that one cannot criticize it. And then that picture, I saw people not wearing gloves. Is that not a, a bad uh, example to use? Because there, there is limitation in that. What mm -hmm. does it say? Yeah. It was actually a bad situation. The lesson model which was designed was a bad situation. Um, but we were trying to uh, make it better to show something out that uh, multimedia uh, specialists have to take note of this and this and this and that. So the research component here, you know, addresses that. Yeah, addresses that. Gloves have to be worn. The proper attire has to be worn. Yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> Thank you for your lecture. It's very inspiring. But back home, we have this virtual university, mm -hmm. which does uh, distant education. Mm -hmm. And the material are uh, online. Mm -hmm. And the students come occasionally for lectures. Mm -hmm. Is this part of that program? Or something different out there? Yeah, thank you. If it is, how different is this one from the virtual investment? Thank you very much. We have the virtual investment, as I said. Um, gradually, uh, we are even pushing the virtual university uh, and making it the subject to the umbrella organization we call the distance education. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. yeah. Akin I remember the, <laughs> uh, the current vice chancellor called me one time and I was asking him why we can't push this OER program into the distance education program. And straight away, what I said was that uh, it might be a, a good idea, <coughs> but we still have to maintain the clear characteristics of the OER program. <coughs> the fundamental difference is that um, OER materials are openly licensed, but the materials being used at the um, virtual university and uh, distance education are copyrighted. You see, so um, in as much as we can 
uh, OER materials can go to the distance education or the virtual university. Um, there's still that difference with the OER um, um, program that the materials have to be openly licensed. But a lot of the materials being used at distance education are copyrighted. You can't do that. If you contravene the provisions of the copyright uh, terms, uh, then you have to leave up for issues. But the workers at the distant learning unit yeah. have been coming to the College of Health Sciences asking us to produce material for them to put online for distant learning. Great. How that this is that in is line with this? Yeah, then that is administrative. Maybe the, the idea is to move the program uh, from being a relationship between currently from College of Health Sciences and the Department of Communication Design to into uh, the building of the uh, distance education program so that um, it will be managed separately but under the same mm -hmm. roof. So it will be a college yeah. with different departments. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that uh, the department that deals particularly with copyrighted materials would have a way of dealing with these issues and an OER to also have a way of uh, dealing with these issues because every material there becomes a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a very yeah. nice job. Um, sorry, I missed the very end. I think either way, just I want to follow up on what Patrick said and also what Ruth was asking. I'll start with Patrick first. It seems like whichever way it goes, if OER enhances distance education yeah. or if this is branching out, that having this model and sharing it across the university, you know, will be ben benefit both programs, I mean, all the, all the programs. Um, and the question I had when you were um, answering Ruth's uh, question is, is the idea that you want to encourage the designers to start with the research part? Yes. So, so, you're, so, so really, it is, it is intended that you're kind of taking the, giving something for them to use as a guide yeah. Saying that you know this, these are the steps you want to go through, and if they find themselves starting at like I or one of the D's, and then, then they could look and say, oh wait, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. this is why I'm having this problem or whatever, and then kind of go back to R. Is it, it is that am I correct in in saying that? Is that what the model is for to kind of give designers something to measure their work by or a process to go through? Like, is it okay, would it be okay if a designer started, like, at A? Yeah, it, w it would be okay to start at A, but along the line, you might have certain problems which would have best been solved if you had right. put them at so the other stage. Yeah, because right now, is there, what are designers using now? Is there any, is there any? In, in fact. Okay. <laughs> As I speak now, there's no. Okay. We don't so have mod any module. We don't, I mean, they, they just yeah. use their own initiative, sit down with the content providers or the SMEs, and then just discuss. Okay. So Basically, the, they determine how the lesson should look. Okay. Like, and once they make, they get this crazy effects and all yeah. that. Yeah. Mean, yeah. yeah so now you're creating standards, procedures, yeah. so that they start off the conversation with the template now. Exactly. And so they know automatically, you know, yeah. no music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if they want to incorporate those ones, um, there should be a way by which they could do it by taking note of not only the visual, the uh, principles of visual design, but um, the 12 principles uh, of minus theory. And initially, I was thinking of a model which looks like the AD model, having the A at the top and the rest following. But being an artist, I don't know. I don't no, this looks nice. This looks nice. Yeah, yeah. 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 flower. <laughs> it looks nice. Yeah, and so I think this is more structurally friendly yeah. than the linear one um, we have in the heading model. My last question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who does the research if you are capturing the process of? Caesarean birth, for instance. Is this a setting who does the research? 
In fact, um, the term here, research is used in a certain context. The content provider is the one who does his research. He does, uh, uh, he brings along the content of the material. But the multimedia specialist also has this research to do in how to structure the lesson module. He has to make sure that he applies certain principles in developing the lesson modules. He has to make sure that certain things are provided for before he begins. So the analysis stage here is a lot where the multimedia specialist discusses the contents and everything of the content provider. The content provider does his primary research and brings his students the project along. There's no way the multimedia specialist, can, uh, there's no way he can take the place of the content provider. I, can, I mean, I can imagine the media specialist going to do research in some other area, which is not their area, in producing the same Can there be disagreement where the searching, for instance, you like uh, some kind of music on the background, coloration on the background, and then the, the media provider will object. Object, yeah. So therefore, there must be a building of consensus on approach. Yeah. In fact, uh, all this process was not only the media specialist, but the subject matter expert or the content provider. They have to sit down. Sometimes, uh, just like you were saying, he might prefer some kind of uh, music in the background, but it's a place for the media specialist to say that this is the level of disabilities it can go. It cannot be too loud because it might distract from the lesson uh, outcomes. So the, there has to be a compromise. But if the multimedia specialist plays his cards very well, uh, we'll end up having a very uh, good environment to produce the lesson. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a you know, for example. Yeah, so these modules are already available, right? They are on the net? Yes. yes. Uh, what kind of feedback have you gotten so far from consumers of these modules. Yeah, well, uh, what I've realized is that most of them are there for particular uh, situations. A lot of uh, training organizations use the models uh, in training their workforce, the administrative workforce and other groups of people. But when it comes to the educational sector, we realize that the survey comes close to that. And the early model is used extensively in educational settings. In fact, I realized that uh, although it's criticized all over in educational institutions, this is the most popular, the RD is the most popular uh, model. And although uh, people might criticize it, there are lots of um, positive comments made about this the early model. I, I, I didn't have any conversation with anybody here initially concerning the use of the AD model. But I, when I made a case, a the case for it, and back in Ghana, and got here, um, I, mean, I was surprised to meet a lady here who, I mean, they have a group, uh, and they are having adopted the AD model, and that was what they were using. So I, I remember making a comment to Catherine that this is surprising because this lady taking the decision already the same decision as we took. So there are lots of positive comments out there in this type of education. So, yeah. Thank you. On, on your own, yeah. when you were evaluating the AD model, yeah. uh, did you come across any limitations or did you like realize on your own you know, besides the criticisms that have been yeah. leveled against it? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. In fact, when I looked at it, um, I realized that um, some of the criticisms are right. But the fact that uh, the criticisms are right doesn't make it unworkable. Okay, so the reason why it still persists since the 70s is because of its very nature. You have to tweak it to suit your particular situation. 
but some of the arguments out there is that you should throw it away and just buy into the digital world. Whatever you want to do, you can do. And so different models have come out which uh, say that maybe if you want the particular situation to get better, then you have to use this model. You have to use this model. This model. And that's how come we have Kemp's model, we have um, Alliance, uh, Savvy, and, uh, and so on. Yeah. So the Andy model, in fact, is, is a classic model which serves as the foundation for all of them. And I've noticed the parts that we put in. And I think that if we add this portion in it, we, we can at least make better the uh, model too. Uh, couple questions. Is there any place that, that I could go and see the module, the ID model online and what it looks like and then compare it to say the other models that you're talking about uh, and just see why they're different or, or could you like have them side by side and say they use this model uh, and here's where it's different from taking your example of, of the Caesarean section, showing a module done based on this model and then the same uh, procedure based on another model and show what the differences are. No, I haven't come across any comparison like that. Um, but um, what I have observed is that um, people pick one model and criticize it and then show their new model. This becomes the foundation, I mean the function by the, <coughs> it's punched and then the next page is a picture of a new model. That's basically what is out there. Yeah, but I haven't come across, or I'm yet to come across uh, a place where there's a comparison between this ID model and another one and then Let's see, let's see models which have been produced and see which one is better than the, than the other. So, so you may have said this already, Adam, but when you go back, will you do some case studies where you, you know, take some...